Bonjour, je m'appelle Karim Guenouni et vous souhaite la bienvenue sur ce nouvel épisode du podcast Génération Kairos. L'objectif de ce podcast est de décortiquer et partager les histoires inspirantes des modèles de réussite au Maroc et dans le monde, dans tous les domaines. Le Kairos est un concept d'origine grecque qui signifie « le moment propice », l'instant T où il faut saisir l'opportunité, avant et trop tôt et après trop tard. Mes invités sont des entrepreneurs ou des leaders dans leur domaine qui ont à force d'efforts su reconnaître et saisir les opportunités au moment décisif. À travers leurs témoignages et une conversation sans filtre, je chercherai à mieux comprendre leur parcours, leur personnalité et les habitudes qui les ont aidés à réussir. Bonne écoute sur Génération Kairos Hi Nordin. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? Good, good. It's really great to uh, to be with you. Thank you uh, very much for hosting me. Um, uh, we are in uh, Yes Series offices in Casablanca. Yeah. I am very, very happy and glad that you took the time to um, so that we could meet in Casablanca. So I wanted to start from there. Mm -hmm. How do you like um, How do you like the city so far, and how how do you feel? I love Casa. I mean, I've uh, I've been coming here since I was a kid. And okay. Uh, to me, honestly, it's uh, one of the best places in the region. So. Okay. So I'm very happy to to hear that, and with, uh, it will give, I think, a special taste to our mm -hmm. conversation. Um, I know your 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 time is very limited, and so I'm going to jump right away in our conversation, and present you. You are Nordin Taibi, a high tech PhD, entrepreneur, investor, co-founder, and CEO of Yasir which is a leading startup for on-demand services, including ride-hailing, food and groceries delivery. You started only five years ago, mm -hmm. right? In Algeria. Correct. And you rapidly uh, developed presence in the Maghreb region and internationally, today serving 8 million users, 45 cities, and improving the lives of 100,000 partners. Correct. Including drivers, couriers, merchants, suppliers, wholesalers. Mm -hmm. I would like uh, to thank Ismail Shape, who made the, the connection. That guy is great because he made that connect first connection between us, and, and I thank him very much. <laughs> <laughs> and you can say hello to him. <laughs> well, well, to him. <laughs> yeah, it's such a delight and honor to have to have this conversation due to three reasons. Let me go quickly uh -huh. to the three reasons. Making you one of the most distinguished entrepreneurs that I have received on this show. For one, if you measure success by the money raised. Mm -hmm. With the Series B in October, last October, I think, of 150 million USD mm -hmm. and a total of, uh, let's say, 200 million dollars, you are, yes, here, sorry, is one of the most valued startups in North Africa and the Middle East. I think it's uh, the first uh, Series B, right? Well, there is a post on LinkedIn, you can, uh, you can, uh, you can see that ranking uh, yeah. Forbes, right? Yeah. Congratulations on that. Thanks. Congratulations on that. You, you will maybe you talk about the importance of money later, but let me go to number two reasons. Uh -huh. uh, number two reason, because if you measure success by the ambition and values carried by Yasir, you are on a journey to build the biggest everyday super app and tech company, uh, moving people, packages, food and money and more, hopefully, in French speaking uh, Africa and Maghreb. I talked about it. And in this process, Yasir will have to morph I don't know if that's the correct word, into a fintech, handling payment services. Correct. So through this conversation, we will try to understand better what is the super app model, the, its challenges in our region, and maybe uh, yes, year's strategy regarding the, mar the, the mm -hmm. market. Number three, if you measure success by the talents and mindset of the entrepreneurs empowering the yes, year's model, I think we can learn a lot from your personal journey. Living the American dream, as a PhD researcher, startup creator, mm. and then this wild dream to show another path to succeed in the development of Algeria and the Maghreb region. So my hope here is to benefit from your practical view of our environment as a diaspora member on how to raise the attractiveness of the region and unlock its talent potential, which is, I think, a part of your of your series mission. Oh yeah, totally. I think it's the number one mich mission, even yeah. Yeah. So I'm very glad that we yeah. could uh, that we could um, uh, discuss about it. So there, there it is. I would like to start with your mission. Mm -hmm. Looking back on these life chapters, your life chapters. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, it's not an easy question. <laughs> you didn't have time to warm up. Um, 
So looking back on these live, your life chapters, I want to relate to the steps that led you to your mission. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, what series of obvious decisions or hard decisions have connected you to this mission? Mm -hmm. Because I think um, I, I, I have made some maths and mm -hmm. I think that you created yes, maybe around 40, age of 40. Yeah. Uh, no, younger. Younger. Younger than that. Yeah. Younger. Yeah. But, but I think that there is some kind of, uh, of something connected to your personal mm -hmm. uh, journey. And uh, and I want you to I want to just focus. Can you can you think about the, the either obvious decision or hard decisions that led you to your mission? Oh, I mean, I think I think all the decisions were super hard, uh, both at the personal and professional level. Um, just to give you a little background, so so I was born and raised in the region, went to the U.S. to pursue further studies. I mean, that was the whole purpose uh, of me going there. So I got my PhD from Stanford, which is in uh, the Silicon Valley region, and you know, like where most of the tech companies are. And actually, Stanford in itself is considered to be the birthplace of um, uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, and most of the companies actually that you see in the valley have been founded by uh, Stanford alumni. And uh, initially, in uh, my professional uh, life, I worked with big tech, so got the chance to you know like learn quite a bit, you know, like from Uh, product R&D all the way to commercialization and that was a great experience and uh, then moved on to actually be an entrepreneur myself you know like once I felt you know like I had enough uh, background and expertise um, to to build you know my own thing so building team raising funds taking things to the next level and to me honestly um, like what I learned like during that process yeah. was just Uh, unbelievable uh, I don't think you know like one uh, like irrespective of you know like how good uh, of an engineer you are like working with the biggest companies uh, tech companies in the world you'll get to actually learn uh, what what you learn as an entrepreneur um, and uh, it was lifetime changing uh, honestly for me Uh, both in terms of you know like my mindset, like the impact that you actually can create not only within your team but also you know like you see actually the impact of your product on people immediately okay um, and uh, and that's the most rewarding thing uh, what uh, what happened with the Asir, I mean it was honestly something not at all planned. I would have never thought that it would even come back to the region one day uh, okay. Um, and uh, just like being from the region, I just wanted to contribute. And initially, it was in a very passive way. I would mentor teams. I even like sometimes like wrote checks, you know, like to teams that I liked. Uh, but to be honest with you, I mean, we always heard lack of funding, bureaucracy are the biggest problem for the entrepreneur in the mm -hmm. region. I'm not saying those are not problems, uh, but to me, the bigger problem was the entrepreneur, him or herself. And what I mean by that is that there was uh, clearly a lack of mindsets. There was clearly a lack of values, uh, a lack of best practices. Uh, and, you know, if you have that at scale, it's really hard for a local champion to emerge, uh, if not impossible. And so for me, really kind of, you know, like uh, my thinking was, If I really want to have an impact, I should get involved uh, uh, myself. Um, that was the only way I could actually see okay. you know, like something happening. Mm -hmm. I'm not honestly. I'm not saying this, you know, like out of ego or anything like that. It just that you know, like it was such a fundamental problem uh, that I could not, you know, like think of you know like uh, any other way to um, to do it. Uh, and you know, like this kind of conclusion like didn't come, you know, like out of the blue. And we're not reinventing the wheel here. Yeah. Um, if you look at like in like other parts of the world uh, where you actually saw like the emergence of local champions, whether that be in China, Southeast Asia, India, Latin America, that's how it started. Um, you always had folks uh, that were from the region uh, that built like a certain experience, uh, mainly in Silicon Valley, uh, that one day decided to go back to, uh, uh, to where they were coming from. And, you know, build those local champions with kind of, you know, like the knowledge and the expertise and the mindset, more importantly, that they acquired. Um, and, I mean, this is the case of like uh, uh, 
like big players in China, like Tencent, uh, in Southeast Asia, like uh, Grab and Gojek and uh, Tokopedia. Uh, in India, it's like, you know, like an endless number of, uh, of startups there. Uh, same thing with, uh, with Latin America, with like players like Nubank, mm-hmm. which is like the largest neo bank in the world now. Yeah, yeah totally. Uh, and so, so, yeah, really like kind of like mission driven. Let's try to create that success model that hopefully would be emulated by others. And to me, like the best way to learn is by doing. And my dream is really you know, like all the people that are going through the t- uh, through ESC or one day would create their own thing and uh, hopefully build even a bigger success model. So that was mission one. Mission two was really to empower the local talent and more so the uh, engineering talent. I mean, as you know, like in our region, unfortunately, there aren't many opportunities and a lot of this talent ends up leaving yeah. uh, mainly to go to Europe to pursue further studies or find jobs there. So really wanted to show that local talent um, can actually build like large-scale platforms and you know uh, make them global okay um i'm i'm proud to for instance say today that we're the largest employer of software developers in the whole Maghreb region okay uh but at the same time you know like our team is not that big i mean our engineering team is not that big uh we're about uh maybe like like 400 people Mm -hmm. that's nothing right so it just tells you you know like how underdeveloped still the region is Mm. Uh, and yeah, but really they, they, they have value engineers working on... Oh, the, yeah, 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 uh, totally, uh, totally. I mean, look, the talent is here. Yeah. Uh, the potential is here. It just, you know, uh, creating an environment for that talent to thrive. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, thank you. Thank you for, st- mm. for uh, stating again your, uh, your, your mission and uh, also uh, connecting it with your career path. Mm. I wanted to uh, to ver- very quickly uh, go back to Algeria mm-hmm. before the age of 21, I think. Mm-hmm. The, the age you uh, you left the country for the U.S., I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I wanted uh, just to, if you can take us uh, or talk to us, sorry, about your background mm-hmm. there, mm-hmm. Um, family background, and um, maybe talk a little bit on what has shaped you. Um, in that in that period, because it's a really important period as a man and <laughs> and a future ambitious entrepreneur. Yeah. Because you, you insisted, I heard you. Mm-hmm. I heard you that uh, the the um, the US was life changing. However, I want to uh-huh. just get a little bit earlier. Well, uh, I, th- I I I think you know, like all your uh, experiences and upbring- upbringing uh, do have an impact. Um, I, although I'm an engineer, I, uh, I really like social sciences and, um, um, like in, and I like to actually mix between, you know, like s- some of my engineering background and social sciences. And if you look at, um, the, um, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a few things and then I'll yeah, connect please, the dots please. between them. And I'll, and I'll, you know, stick in, you know, kind of, you know, like my childhood uh, in there as well. Uh, to me, um, you know, like uh, for an ecosystem to work, uh, you have to have uh, like a very strong uh, value system. Mm-hmm. And when we think usually about values, we always think about moral values. I mean, moral value, values are uh, super important. I'm not saying otherwise. Uh, but you can also create environments where, like ambition, uh, creativity, boldness, um, uh, self-confidence, could be um, values that that you grow up with. And the very meaning of actually culture is like a value system mm. uh, in a society. Yeah. Um, I mean, like from an anthropological point of view, uh, culture is simply defined as. Uh, 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 an ensemble of values yeah, that the person values. finds mm. like since birth mm. and uh, and actually like uh, that the person will use as a primary capital in a very unconscious way and that would actually decide kind of you know like the impact that person will have uh, in his or her society yeah. so without you realizing um, like you're gonna um like what def- what is going to define your impact is like the values that you had. So imagine you know, like if uh, creativity, ambition, uh, self confidence uh, are like inculcated with in you, like without you even realizing, like the impact it can have. Yeah. You don't have to think about it twice, right? Like it's inherent in you. 
So you're going to be taking risks. You're going to be creative. You're going to be, you know, like trying to uh, uh, have an impact. And to me, that's what I call um, like, uh, like a society or a community that is in equilibrium. Mm -hmm. Because if you have that, like you're going to be having a big impact uh, with a small effort. Yeah. So, so that's, that's to me, you know, like the ultimate, uh, uh, like, uh, value system that you can create. And interestingly enough, like in, uh, in physics, which is, you know, like the basis of, you know, like any engineering, uh, uh, curriculum, uh, there is this, um, uh, principle, which is called like the principle of equilibrium, which is honestly like just like a rearrangement of uh, the second law of thermodynamics. And it states that an entity is in equilibrium only if it reaches a minimum state of energy. Uh, and I truly believe that <laughs> this principle actually uh, applies to societies, to companies, to, uh, uh, to nations. So uh, a nation or a society or a company uh, that is in equilibrium is where with a minimum effort you can create a big impact. Okay. Um, so now like I'm connecting this to uh, first my background like uh, as a child and then going to the U.S. And so as a child, what... Uh, and again, you know, like as a child, like you don't realize what's, what's actually, you know, like going around you. Uh, but um, like the first contact, like towards, you know, like building that value system is really your parents. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think I was very lucky um, to have parents that had experiences in their lives that were uh, somehow unique uh, in which, you know, like uh, ambition, perseverance, uh, helping the other, uh, paying it forward, um, uh, were things that they did all their lives. So it was kind of, you know, like he... Um, uh, a living example that I saw, uh, which without me realizing, you know, got transferred to me. Yeah. Sometimes it's just like little stories, you know, like of their lives uh, that uh, that they would tell you once as a child, you know, like it, like you absorb it, but you actually think that uh, it, it doesn't have any impact. Uh, but as you grow up, like you realize that it actually did. Um uh, you know, both my parents uh, were born and grew up during the French colonization. Uh, it was it was a tough period, you know, in a sense that uh, education wasn't open mm -hmm. uh, uh, to uh, to everyone. Uh, my mom had always the ambition to be a medical doctor since she was a child, and uh, I remember, for instance, you know, like a story that um, she mentioned it once, but like. Uh, till now, you know, like I still remember vividly when uh, uh, when she when she talked about it, you know, like she was like in elementary school, uh, she was brilliant, she was top of her class, and she had a French teacher um, that once, you know, like asked her what she wanted to do as a mm -hmm. child, uh, you know, as an adult, and she would tell her. Uh, my mom was shy, so she she like you know like. The, the, the teacher was asking her, like, what do you want to do? And she couldn't respond. And, um, and so the teacher started giving suggestions. So what do you want to be? Like, do you want to be cleaner? Do you want to... I mean, like, she, she started, you know, giving small yeah. jobs because, you know, like, she saw her as, like, an indigenous and, like, she wasn't to the level of, you know, uh, French people. And then at some point, you know, like, out of pride, like, my mom just, like, responded. And she's like, no, I want to be a doctor. And uh, the teacher's response was like, oh, no, these are, like, you know, not jobs for people like you. Um, uh, but then, you know, like my mom persevered, right? And uh, luckily independence came and she got, you know, she, she realized her dream. And continuing on this story, um, uh, you know, like uh, something that really blew my mind, and, you know, like till now, you know, like when, when I think about it is um, like kind of like as a big drive. So, uh, you know, like at the end of like the elementary cycle, mm -hmm. you have to take uh, the exam. And she was telling me that um, when it was time to take the exam, uh, like my grandfather received a letter saying that she would not be able to, I mean, simply because uh, she was indigenous. Okay. Um, and uh, my grandfather went nuts, like when he received that letter. And like he went and talked to the, to the mayor, to the director of, uh, uh, of the school, to, you know, like he basically literally like created a campaign like just to make 
uh, and it wasn't just like uh, towards my mom. It was like towards all the indigenous girls. Uh, okay. It was you know like a, uh, a girls' school, and he just pushed so much that they were allowed to uh, 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 to enter the exam. Uh, a rebellion act of uh, yeah, yeah, literally. Mm. But what was you know like amazing in this story is that my grandfather never told my my mom till actually she got her medical degree like maybe like 20 wow. years later or something wow. um that's that's a that's a big parent support parent to child exactly, support exactly in the and shadow yeah um same thing with my dad i mean my dad lost his father like at a very young age uh my grandmother was illiterate you know like she didn't know how to uh, to read or write but she surrounded him uh with so many things um uh, uh she understood you know like if if she was able to surround him with the right people uh giving him you know like the right tools he'll be able to succeed and it wasn't easy for him i mean like he would tell me you know like the first days when he went to college it wasn't something simple and dorms for instance simple as, sim as simple as you know like finding a place to sleep like uh, in a university dorm mm -hmm. like wasn't open uh, uh to him because he was indigenous and he would literally you know like spend the night in hammam okay and you know like early in the morning at 5 a.m like the owner of the hammam would throw water at them and like you know like the many times that he thought about quitting uh but you know there was that level of perseverance that you know like i want to achieve something and so when you grow in such an environment like and you hear these stories i mean as a kid like you don't really care honestly i mean like i see it with my kids today you know like i tell them stories about my child like <laughs> like so what right but like you absorb it in a passive way yeah of course and it actually shapes you as a person mm. um and so I, th I, th i think that was really essential in my life honestly Uh, because look, like we're all born equal. I don't think you know, like one is more intelligent than the other. I don't think uh, one is um, uh, uh, is born like inherently with these values. It's it's really shaped by the environment you're in, um, and I think that's what I got that made it you know like different uh, 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 than others. Um, Thank you, thank you very much, Nordin, for uh, share for sharing this uh, personal stories mm. that uh, that really resonates with uh, with me. Mm. And you think all people have the same potential? It's a good it's a good oh, news yeah. from a PhD researcher from Stanford. It's very good news. Yeah. So that um, it's the same uh, luck for uh, for everybody to pursue. Uh, oh yeah, its totally. potential. Totally, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, let's move forward um, mm. to. Um, To your studies, mm -hmm. uh, you graduated from uh, Stanford University. So you left Algeria to, mm -hmm. to the mm -hmm. U.S. I don't know if it, it, there is an interesting story for not going to France or going to instead of oh. going to the U.S. Is there an interesting story of, um, of luck or of choice? Uh, it was choice. I mean, it goes back to what I was talking about. You know, like, I, I think, again, you know, like, I go back to what the definition of culture is, right? Like, mm. a, a value system that you have as a primary capital and that you use, like, in a subconscious way, like, without you realizing. And so, when I was finishing my engineering degree, uh, it's like, you know, like, what do I want to do next? And, okay, you make the decision to pursue further studies. Where do you want to do them? And, like, The easy option is go to France, right? You know, like proximity, language, same system. Uh, community. Community, yeah, true, true. But then, you know, like when you look at it, it's like what's the best educational system in the world? It's the U.S. Yeah. And if you have the value of ambition, you want to go okay, who, seek the best. Who influenced you on taking that decision? Was it by yourself or did you reach out to somebody? Uh, Because I think it's a life-changing uh, decision. No, no, totally. Um, I think it was really like my parents that supported uh, me uh, during that process. My eldest brother as well. Um, and kind of, you know, trying to uh, educate myself about like the, uh, uh, how the U.S. system worked. Mm. And, you know, like when I realized that you could actually apply and there are possibilities to not only get admitted by U.S. schools, but actually receiving a scholarship from these engineering, I mean, from these U.S. schools themselves, yeah. I'm like, okay, why don't I try? Like, I have nothing to lose. Okay, so, so. it's a very bold decision, mm -hmm. and uh, congratulations to you for, for, for taking uh, it. Uh, and so I, I'm going to move uh, forward. Um, so Stanford University, um, 
and then uh, your PhD there, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then you joined the Intel, correct? Uh, working for this semiconductor manufacturing giant. Uh, you t I think I think we're gonna skip this part because you already uh, you already um, said that it was life changing. Oh. We had lessons about being bold and being ambition mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. being, I don't know, having the best education in the world. Yeah. Uh, look, uh, two things that I learned at um, Stanford and one thing I learned that uh, like my uh, my work experience at Intel, maybe mm -hmm. you know, like I can like go briefly through them. Um, one thing that I learned at Stanford and it kind of like goes back to what I was saying earlier is the mindset. Stanford is really considered like the birthplace of uh, of Silicon Valley and like pretty much you know like the high tech industry, uh, and uh, and if you look at you know like why Stanford became that, it was really like a series of incidents. Mm -hmm. uh, Stanford as a university in itself like started by this guy named Stanford. Uh, who used to be uh, governor of California, and he was a very rich person. He actually made money before being a governor in uh, uh, railroad. Uh, like one day visiting Europe with his wife and uh, only child, uh, his only child who was a boy passed away, uh, got sick and, uh, and died. And so he decided to actually give up all his lands uh, and make it into a university and actually the idea was to make all the children of California have a proper education. So it was like an incident, you know, in, okay. in life. And then, like, uh, in the 30s, late 30s, early 40s, between the big recession and World War II, uh, the, that universe, I mean, Stanford became like a very prestigi prestigious university, but like there was no industry around it. Mm. I mean, most of the... Uh, the students would go to back to the U.S. East Coast to find jobs. And so he went, uh, like he, uh, an, a guy named Fred Terman, which, who was the, uh, the dean of engineering at the university, went to the, uh, uh, the administrators of the university and told them, look, uh, we need to think about uh, creating an ecosystem around the university because, you know, like this is not mm -hmm. sustainable and convince the university to actually start investing in companies that would be uh, started by, uh, uh, by Stanford students. Uh, and that was actually like the beginning of it because like the very first few that were funded were uh, people that were named Hewlett and Packard that yeah. created HP. Uh, it was Varian. Varian was the creator of like the vacuum tube, which was the predecessor of uh, the transistor, and that created actually a virtuous circle, uh, in a sense that because those guys were helped, they started helping others, mm -hmm. uh, and it just like snowballed, uh, and it created you know like an environment where it was easy to get the best talent, the most intelligent talent, and also money that you know allowed that talent to actually build great things and that's how silicon valley was i mean people always tell, say like silicon valley is about uh, smart people and money honestly i think it's uh it's about uh the values of helping one another and being convinced that the success of the other uh, is as important as uh, one's success. It's very, it's very generous uh, way of saying things in a very highly competitive environment. You, you uh, see uh, what uh, I mean? It's yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're not mutually. You can have both. Yeah, yeah. The, okay. Honestly, they're not mutually exclusive, and okay. you see it. Uh, and it, and it and it can be done at like many levels. Uh, like one example I always give, um, like in the city of Palo Alto, where the, the university is, uh, and you know, like it's considered to be the uh, uh, the capital of Silicon Valley, and so so my kids go to school there. There there are these programs that cost zero dollars. Um, they go from elementary uh, preschool all the way to high school. So last six months of the year, they uh, they have a student work with someone from the city. It could be like an artist, it could be a tech CEO, you name it, depending on, say, like the preference of the student. And they have them work together for, um, for those six months on a new project. Uh, it's a few hours a week, uh, and, uh, and it has a huge impact. Why? 
because the student is going to see that person and they're going to see that that person is very simple. Mm. So unconsciously, they'll be like, if this person succeeded, I should be able to succeed. So that inculcates uh, ambition. Uh, they're going to create. They're going to work on something new, of course, at the level of the, or the capacity of the students. So with time, they'll be like, uh, like creativity and you know, like a generation of idea will yeah. be incul inculcated in them. And at the end of the program, they actually have the students present their work uh, in the uh, Palo Alto Museum, and it's like all the inhabitants of the city come and celebrate them, you know, like see them present and everything. So it builds not only confidence in these uh, kids, but it also completes the virtuous circle because the whole community is there to support them. And that's like zero dollar. Wow. So imagine that students, you know, like when, when they actually finish their uh, university degree, like the impact that they can have. Yeah. Um, and that's actually, you know, like Stanford was able to do it even within the university, like that mentality of, you know, like I want to conquer the world. Um, a Stanford person will tell you, uh, irrespective of what they want to do, I mean, they want to, they could be entrepreneurs, they could be, I don't know, like researchers. Um, the mindset is like, I'm going to be uh, pursuing something that will make you forget everything else. It doesn't mean that they're going to succeed, but having that mindset is, I think, super duper important. So. Wow, you, I, I could feel the vibration for a minute. Um, it's, now it's very interesting mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, to, to take these ideas and to try to implement in our environment. Mm -hmm. Maybe mm -hmm. it, uh, it's, it may give us mm -hmm. more ideas about mm -hmm. how to improve things mm -hmm. at, at, our, um, yeah. at our level. And to me, honestly, th this is key. This, to me, this is the basic. Solve this and then everything else will come. Money will come. Uh, uh, smart people will come. It's, uh, yeah, it, it will be a virtuous circle. Okay. Mm. Uh, but moving on to your first entrepreneur experience, mm. uh, very quickly, Incense, mm. mm. uh, new generation of 3D motion sensors, mm. $1.6 million uh, grants, um, maybe, I'm not sure about the figure, but sold to VC. Mm. What I want you to understand in briefly is um, how was Nordin as rookie deep tech <laughs> entrepreneur? I mean, it's your yeah. first one. Yeah. How, how, uh, how was it? Uh, two things, honestly. Um, I, I wasn't as rookie as um, as one could think, because my experience at Intel like was very enriching. So I was part of a division called Intel Labs, and that's like kind of like the R and D division of Intel. And it, the way it worked, it really worked like startups. So you had like you know like initially small teams that would come up with an idea, convince upper management that you know this is an idea that was worth pursuing, and then the upper management would actually fund uh, that team. And so I was lucky to actually be in a team that we started very small with an idea and then we developed it and we proved that, you know, like um, uh, this could be a uh, really great product mm. and got the chance to actually uh, taking it, you know, like from a simple research idea uh, to develop the product okay. and to commercialize the product. Okay. And so I got the chance to actually live the whole process. Okay. Um, and have, you know, like, uh, exper build experience and expertise beyond just, you know, like the engineering side of things. So you touch, you touch on every aspect, on sales, on marketing, exactly. on pricing, on exactly. tech, on Exactly. Everything. So okay. it was everything. Because, you know, like, you could have, you know, like, a great engineering or a great technology, uh, but if you're not able to sell it, mm. it's pointless, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, and, uh, and so that experience really, like, was super important. But it wasn't everything. I mean, like, I, like uh, truly, like when I decided to jump off the cliff and become an entrepreneur, indeed it did help, but uh, it didn't give me, you know, like all the answers. Mm. Uh, and uh, the decision to be an entrepreneur was like, you know, if I don't do this now, when am I going to do it? Mm. Um, and, and I'm like, worst case that can happen is that, you know, it doesn't work out and I can, you know, always uh, try to find a job. Yeah. Uh, and I did leave actually like a very comfortable job, to be honest, like in terms of like pay, uh, in terms of like perks. Uh, uh, but like at some point, like I, I didn't feel, you know, like I was contributing much and, you know, like I wasn't happy. Um, and so, yeah, uh, took the decision actually a month before the birth of my third child. So it was okay. <laughs> so just like to give you an idea, uh, like how big of a risk uh, I took. Um, and it was the most rewarding experience ever. Um, because, I mean, 
uh, one thing that I've seen, like especially in the region, and especially you know, like like you were talking about, like the diaspora before and the impact it can have in the region. Um, we have a lot of engineers that you know, like have gone to the U.S. or to the Europe uh, to um, and had like an impact within their companies, but they remained in engineering roles. Uh, honestly, being an engineer, even in like in the biggest tech company in the world. And being an entrepreneur doesn't make you an entrepreneur. Mm. And I've lived it. I mean, I thought, you know, like I had enough experience to uh, uh, to be a great entrepreneur. But I found out that, you know, being an entrepreneur is totally different than being a great engineer. Um, um, like the way you process things, uh, uh, the way you look at technology, not just like in terms of like... Uh, uh, how powerful it is, but like how you can actually commercialize it, you know, like how you can actually generate revenues out of it and making sure that the unit economics are right, how to actually raise funds, build a team, like uh, build a culture like with val- with strong values. Um, that was... Okay, yeah. we'll have, we'll have an, um, I hope enough time to talk about Yesir, which okay. I invite <laughs> you to, to step into right now because of, of the time. Oh, yeah. um, so uh, I wanted to uh, to split the the story of Yasir in some uh, mm-hmm. in some parts, and uh, excuse me for that. Just to just to uh, to uh, to bring to the audience the um, mm. the, the the shifts, mm. ma- the major shifts. Mm. So I understand from Yasir, Yasir, which by the way means easy, okay, mm-hmm. um, in Arabic. Uh, it's the name of the brand that uh, mm-hmm. that uh, was launched in uh, Algeria in 2016. I 17, no, no. Yeah, I mean, okay. but there I was an incorporation in 2016, but we didn't really start till 2016. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for the precision, but I really want to go to the idea. I, I know you have a, a co-founder in, uh, in Algeria, mm-hmm. and uh, I really want to know the backstory, because uh-huh. we're in Casablanca, we need the backstory. <laughs> <laughs> and um, how you... I, the iteration around the uh, around the product market fit. Uh-huh. Why 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 I'm saying the iteration because after that we're going to go to step two where you build the model that you brought to Tunisia, mm-hmm. Morocco, mm-hmm. and 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 started the, mm-hmm. the raising the raising uh, journey yeah, yeah. from that. Uh, I mean, look, uh, uh, what uh, what we noticed, like you know, like the decision was made to you know create a company, right? Like, you know, jump off the cliff and uh, go through the experience. But, you know, like, didn't know, like, what business model to go after. And uh, something we noticed early on, which is obvious, is that, you know, like, most of the population in the region uh, is unbanked. I mean, when I say region, I mean, you can even look at, you know, like, the whole African continent. I mean, today, like, Africa... Is uh, has a GDP of over three trillion dollars. Seventy-two percent of it is in the informal market in cash transaction, uh, and even if you look at like consumer expenditure, two trillion dollars expected to actually double up in a few years, uh, and most of it is in cash transaction in small shops in the informal markets. And if you look at why this is, it's not because of a lack of a banking system. Banking system is here. It's just that people don't trust it. And one has to say it. Uh, you know, the number one reason is actually uh, all these like merchants want to evade paying taxes. So, mm. uh, so cash remains king. And what was interesting in the region, uh, the Maghreb region, and also like a lot of the French-speaking countries, when we first started, on-demand services that we know about, ride-hailing, food delivery, grocery delivery, was pretty much inexistent. And if you dug further into it, most people were actually spending their money in transportation and food. Transportation because you have big cities like Casablanca mm. uh, with very archaic public transportation. Uh, so product market fit is there. Food, uh, we are in a region where like family sizes are around like five to six people. Mm-hmm. Um, and people spent uh, uh, on food. And so we were like, why don't we use on-demand services? They solve important and immediate needs. And of course, if we execute well, we could have a very large user base. But more importantly, like that user base subconsciously trusts you mm. because you're solving a lot of their problems. And that's when it actually makes sense to start providing payment solutions. And when I say providing payment solutions, um, on-demand services are what we call in English multi-sided marketplaces. So you're not just targeting the consumers. Uh, You're targeting the supply who are the drivers and the couriers. You're targeting the merchants. You're targeting uh, FMCGs, wholesalers, distributors that you connect to the merchants. So you've created actually like a whole ecosystem. 
And you could leverage that ecosystem to uh, provide these payment services, but also uh, use them. Uh, like for instance, you know, like something that we're implementing today is that we're using our drivers and couriers as mobile agents to collect the cash and transfer the cash into electronic money. Mm. Uh, this is in Algeria, right? Yeah, yeah. And this is something that we'll be expanding okay. into all the geos we operate in. Um, and yeah, so so that was our business model from day one. From day one? Yeah. Okay. And then the question was where, like... Where are you in day one? Are you in, uh, in the US? In your... Uh, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, all over. In all over. In the coffee shop? Or are you in... Uh, no, no, no. I mean, I, I started coming to the region, uh, you know, like uh, trying to identify the first elements that, uh, okay. that I could hire. You mentioned, you know, like Mahdi earlier, like Mahdi is like an all-time friend. We went to school together. So I started talking to him. He's like, you know, let's do this. Uh, yeah, so so kind of you know starting to put like the the initial pieces of the puzzle together mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, trying to make things happen. Okay, so you have the you have some money maybe uh, from the uh, incense, right? The yeah, yeah, so sold. You have some initially some money. Uh, yeah, so invest capital to start. Yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, and yeah, so it started as. Um, as an idea, but what was more important is, you know, to know how to build a strategy around it and start executing. Okay. While, you know, keeping the mission. So empowering local talent and, uh, uh, and trying to have that impact that we were talking about earlier. Okay, so this brings us to, to step number two. Mm -hmm. so it, mean, it means the model is working in Algeria, mm -hmm. in the home base, and then you, um, uh, I think you came in Morocco in uh, 2019. Yeah, end of 2019, yeah. And uh, of course, there. Are, I want you to just to talk about some challenges mm -hmm. and how you you handle you handle them because they are. Uh, I think uh, many people are surprised mm -hmm. in a positive way by your uh, by your journey because mm -hmm. there are many challenges in our region. Yeah. Regular regulatory, uh, of course, the technology is uh, has to be stabilized and uh, mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, as you said, you have to bring that marketplace. So you have to basically bring in drivers, uh, merchants, uh, and so on. Can you talk just about challenges uh, that you that you had problems that you had to solve in our region? Oh, uh, a lot. Um, look, I think I, I think the importance in any business is to have you know product market fit, and to have product market fit is that you need to solve for a solution uh, for a problem where there is a necessity. Um, when you have a necessity, you know, like even if your product is not great, like you'll have adoption. Okay. Um, and I think, you know, like what really helped us was that, you know, like we always tackled problems where there was a necessity. Um, and, uh, and that allowed us to, you know, like grow very quickly, like show that product market fit, uh, get the numbers, with which, you know, like we would go and say, like raise money with and then come back and improve things like very quickly. I mean, so the challenge is, you know, like how can you actually do both simultaneously and uh, and build a team that is, you know, like really ambitious and has the attention to details that can allow you to do it. And you can imagine, I mean, like you were talking, you know, like about our region and, you know, like how hard to do things, mentality uh, of people that you work with and your customers add to it, you know, like uh, regulatory hurdles. And so, to be honest, like we were risk takers. So we we're like, okay, let's push the limits, even if the regulatory framework is not there, prove that we're actually adding value, and then go to the regulators and talk to them. It's like, look, we're bringing in values, we're creating this many direct jobs, indirect jobs, we're a local champion, we're creating this value of, you know, like empowering the engineering talent in the region. Uh, uh, and of course, you know, like through our platform, you know, like uh, uh, taxes are being paid, uh, help us close the gap. Okay. Uh, it's not easy, I'm not saying, you know, like it's simple, but honestly, as you do keep showing progress, uh, people start listening to you and they want to help you genuinely. Um, and yeah, so it's, I think it's a combination of um, like really understanding what, who the stakeholders are. And sometimes the stakeholders are not, have nothing to do with the business. Um, and yeah, just, just trying to execute and persevere. Okay. Let's talk uh, just two minutes about Morocco. Yes, mm -hmm. here in Morocco. Mm -hmm. My guess, mm -hmm. and you correct me if I'm wrong, my guess is that uh, Yasir is a, a challenger. Mm -hmm. Strong one. Mm -hmm. But still a challenger. Can you just give us some insights about what is yeah, your sure. uh, 
Yeah. What is your um, next move for for uh, for Morocco? Yeah, sure. Um, so so we do believe that you know like uh, Morocco uh, is uh, is a big market, so it's super duper important for us. You know, like from a strategy and execution point of view. Uh, I think what differentiates us from incumbents, because like when we actually launched, you know, like there were incumbents already present, whether that be in the uh, ride hailing or the uh, the delivery businesses. Uh, but I think you know, like what we've done well that the others didn't do. One is we've always been like very uh, uh, keen into implementing a business with sound unit economics. Meaning that from day one we wanted to build, you know, like profitable business. Mm -hmm. So we weren't like any uh, in that framework of um, like burning cash okay. to to get to growth. And the way we did that is, you know, like being very strategic, uh, making sure that you know, like we work with partners that allow us, you know, like to uh, to get to that profitability. So growth was slower, totally. But especially, you know, like in the presence of competition, uh, but like at some point, like you reach an inflection point uh, uh, where you find yourself actually like the strongest. Uh, that's one. Two, we're the only ones that provide multiple services uh, in the region. And that gives you power because you start bundling between the different products that you have. And then you start, you know, like uh, users realizing that if they say within the ecosystem of services that you offer, it actually is more relevant to them than, you know, um, using multiple uh, providers for uh, multiple services. Um, and I think, you know, like that's, that's what's allowing us to penetrate the markets um, uh, and, uh, and have an impact. And I think honestly, it's just a question of time for us, you know, like to be the number one in, okay. uh, so. in here. And with this fundraising that we did, um, uh, one of uh, one of the focuses is to actually, you know, like uh, deploy more capital uh, in Morocco okay. and accelerate, you know, like that process. So uh, I am expecting. I am just expecting uh -huh. that I will, we will uh, hear a lot about this in the next yeah. uh, weeks, months, yeah. and uh, and yeah. uh, speaking about money. Uh -huh. I, I think uh, I, I saw in one of inter interviews that you have a team raising money, like uh, mm -hmm. specialized in, 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 ra in raising money. So uh, since you are um, located in the US, mm -hmm. I think it's a, it's a business as a, as a, mm -hmm. as a whole. Um, what could you just share with us about the, uh, maybe the, uh, the, ra the, the raising money journey? Maybe what uh, advice could you give to such a founder, mm -hmm. maybe even in the region, mm -hmm. with your perspective. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, look, capital is important, uh, especially in a startup. Startup, by definition, means a, uh, a company with exponential growth. And to be able to uh, have that exponential growth, you need to accelerate things. Um, uh, accelerate things, meaning that, you know, like you need to build a team very quickly, uh, if you're, you know, like an, in, uh, like a, um, if your product is, you know, like uh, technology based, you need to build that technology very quickly, and um, so you need to hire, like, you know, like high quality engineers to be able to do it, and that's continuous. Mm. Uh, like to be able to achieve the growth, you need to raise money, you need to grow your team, uh, and get things to the next level. It doesn't mean that you're gonna do it, you know, like. By, by burning cash, as long as, you know, like the unit economics of your business are healthy, it, it honestly doesn't matter. Um, so yeah, capital becomes, you know, like a very important uh, uh, variable in the equation. Uh, and then, you know, like a startup has like different stages. Uh, you have uh, the first stage, which is like, uh, uh, like what we call like the seed stage, you know, like it's the very beginning. You might just have an idea or, you know, like you've proven product market fit at the, you know, like a small scale. And then you have the growth phase and then the uh, the late stage phase. And these, these are, you know, like common terminologies. Mm -hmm. I mean, like if you go to a website of like any uh, uh, venture capital firm, uh, like they'll tell you, I mean, th th they'll have their portfolio companies per, per the stage where they're at. And so like in the early stage, really, it's all about storytelling, how you sell your story. Uh, um, the, uh, not only, you know, like um, showing that you have a very understanding of the problem and how you're solving it, uh, but also showing that 
you know the details uh, uh, of how you want to do it. Okay. So that really gives confidence to uh, 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 to the investors. Uh, so storytelling is really like an important uh, part in uh, in the whole thing. Uh, and investors actually like when you look at their criteria, the first criterion is the founder. Uh, if they have the littlest doubt, doubt about the founder, they'll never look at the idea or the market, even if you know the idea is great or the market size are big. Okay, so there, 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 there you come. Yeah, there you come in the, into the picture. I mean, uh -huh. the team is. Uh, uh -huh. what, what I'm trying to say that the team is raising money. Uh -huh. Okay, the very, very highly skilled team. Uh -huh. But you are the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're the, the face, the, right? The number, the number yeah, ten yeah. in the team. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so you're the face. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and yes, and you know, like w why investors look at founders? It's not you know, kind of like a feeling thing. Data shows that you know, okay. founder-driven companies are usually uh, the most uh, the most successful ones. Okay, uh, and it happens over and over again. You know, like it's uh, I mean, it's 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 a big trend. Um, and so, um, so yeah, like at early stage, it's really about storytelling, showing that you're a charismatic founder and that you've, you've understood, you know, like what you're doing. Uh, growth stage, it's still about storytelling, but you have to show the numbers. Okay. Uh, and then late stage, really, I mean, like it's, it gets to a point where, um, you know, uh, you're building a big organization and everything is there. And yeah. Okay. So we're going to talk a few minutes about this stage, uh -huh. the last stage. Uh -huh. You talked uh, to us about the super app model mm -hmm. um, and the challenges, the competition. Okay, let's talk about the management. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I understand that there are already maybe 20 offices, 1,000 well, employees. Yeah, in a different... Uh, so it's... Uh, more than that. Uh, I okay. mean, in terms of employees, I think we're more than that, yeah. Okay, so it's, it's a big company. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, and uh, with a tech hub uh, in Algeria and Germany... Um, yeah. and, and the presence in the countries for the diaspora in France and Canada for maybe for the mm -hmm. future transfers mm -hmm. and the operations locally Morocco, mm -hmm. Senegal and so on mm -hmm. so you are a global company uh -huh. how, how do you handle that in this highly growth um, yeah period? Uh, very good question and the culture how yeah. do you yeah, yeah, true, save, true. save that yeah, uh, culture yeah. and values actually uh, so, so, so just to, uh, to give you a glimpse on our engineering team uh, we actually hire engineering talent in every country we operate in because we want to empower the local talent so we have engineering uh, uh, members in, in Morocco Algeria Tunisia um, uh, Senegal you name it so, so it's something super important and uh, the reason we actually created the key uh, hub in uh, in Europe, in Paris and Berlin, was to also attract the engineering talent that is originally from the region that went to Europe uh, because primarily they didn't find, you know, like uh, opportunities mm -hmm. in the region. But then, you know, like went on and worked, you know, like for uh, big uh, uh, tech uh, companies uh, and have that experience and expertise. They identify themselves with a mission and can ha bring in that added value that we have. So, so that's something you know, like uh, important to us. So, go, and, and I'll tie that to what you were saying. You know, like when you get to a certain growth level, uh, you need to tap into people that have already done it before. It mm -hmm. becomes like an existential, actually, okay. uh, uh, problem. You cannot be a continuous learner. Exactly. Okay. You cannot. Mm -hmm. If you really want to build like a, a successful organization, very quickly. You have to do it, okay? Because you know, like as you grow very quickly, and uh, like it, it goes back to the question you asked, you're uh, collecting debt at so many levels. Because you know, it's it's not normal, right? I mean, mm -hmm. like imagine you know, like a, uh, a kid growing from uh, uh, you know being a toddler to an adult in a year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So so you can imagine, you know, like the, it's a the trauma. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly trauma, right? Like the bones like will be stretched. It's like yeah. so 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 yeah. And it's really the case for, you know, like yeah, a startup. Like you're collecting that debt and that debt could be so heavy that, you know, like in no time it can actually make things collapse. Yeah. Um and so being conscious of that, you need to have people that, you know, like have already done it before that can, you know, like identify where these debts are and uh, uh, compensating for them. Okay. Uh, and usually the way you compensate for them is um, getting the right people that have already done it before and solve for those. Uh, 
uh, and that's the biggest challenge. So that means that you need to build like a strong C-suite. Uh, you need to have uh, identified, you know, like all these issues uh, that I'm telling you. It doesn't mean that you have to correct fully for them, but at least, you know, like minimize them to keep, you know, like growing. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's, it's honestly a big challenge. Um, growth stage is a lot more difficult than, um, than the, you know, the early stages of product market fit. Okay. Yeah. I wanted to have uh, to ask a question about, in, about the the fintech model. Mm -hmm. Can you just focus about what is the mm -hmm. just to, to understand the, the the strategy difference between uh -huh. and the francophone Africa uh -huh. uh, with the mobile with the mobile money wallets mm -hmm. and the Maghreb region maybe uh, not not very keen on uh, mobile money. Mm -hmm. How how uh, did you analyze uh, things and what's yeah. your, 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 yeah, yeah. your idea? Honestly, I think. Um, I think, you know, like in terms of like adoption, uh, it's just a question of, you know, uh, uh, execution. I don't think, you know, like there has been an entity yet in our region that uh, that knew how to do it. Mm. Um, uh, I think, you know, like if you have like the right strategy and execution behind it uh, on the country, I think our region is actually a lot more interesting than a lot of the sub-Saharan countries like Kenya and others. And even like in terms of purchase power, it's far, far much higher. Um, I think, you know, like what mobile money uh, in sub-Saharan Africa failed to do is that um, it doesn't go beyond, uh, you know, like peer-to-peer -peer and merchant payments. Mm. It kind of, you know, like stuck there. Because if you have like a pure fintech play, um there's so much you can actually offer to the uh, to the customer. Yeah. Uh, what we noticed in our case was that you could do a lot more, like in terms of creating virality and adoption, when you have, um, you know, like embedded finance or you know, mm -hmm. like embedded like fintech solution, because uh, not only are you creating that ecosystem that I was telling you about, mm -hmm. you know, customers, uh, drivers, couriers, merchants, FMCGs, wholesalers, distributors. And so you can start, you know, like offering like a large panoply of payment services to, you know, like all the sides of the marketplace, but you're also leveraging them because they're making money uh, with you. Yeah. Uh, same thing with the consumer, you know, like to, for them to actually adopt your solution. I'm just shooting here, you know, like, uh, like I want to, uh, to make you adopt, you know, like my wallet solution. So you, you're about to order something through my platform and then you got to pop up as like, if you use your wallet, you, you know, you top up your wallet, you're going to get, uh, like a, a discount. Mm. So like that will, ins uh, incite you to actually use it. And then you start using it twice, three times, four times. And then like, it just becomes, you know, like part of, uh, part of the adoption. Whereas, you know, if I'm coming with you directly, and I'm going to tell you, Oh, I have a mobile money wallet, start using it. You're like, what's the incentive yeah. for me? What's I don't even trust you. Right. Mm. So, yeah. okay. Um, last closing questions very quickly. I, I want you to help me understand one thing, which is ambition mm -hmm. because it's very important. And, mm -hmm. uh, why? Because we, we've seen growth in the five years. Uh -huh. So ambition is key. Yeah. Help me understand ambition. Is this how you see yourself? Um, how do you nurture it? Mm -hmm. Especially when you, when you are in our environment, mm -hmm. do you have, uh, any insights to share with us? Uh, I mean, it, it Part of it goes back to what I said initially. Uh, literally, you could inculcate am ambition as a, as a social value since like an early age. Um, and, uh, and that's really key. Like if, if you don't have it, you know, like an early stage of your life, it's really hard to acquire it later. I mean, it's like, you know, like speaking languages, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's so easy for you to learn a new language when you're a kid and it's so much harder as you yeah. grow older. Um, so... So for me, I think, you know, like I was, as I mentioned, like, you know, at the very beginning, I was lucky to be in that environment where, you know, I saw it. I saw it in my parents. I saw it, you know, like in, in people around me or, you know, like I saw it when I went to the U.S., like, you know, uh, at Stanford and like in Silicon Valley in general. Um, and look, I mean, like ambition is like you want to push the limits of what's possible. Um, and you persevere and you do it over and over again, you know, like you're resilient, like irrespective of, you know, like the problems that you have, irrespective of, you know, like maybe uh, someone um, uh, uh, taking advantage of your trust and, you know, like doing uh, uh, 
I mean, betraying that trust. Um, yeah, it's, it's really a mindset, to be honest. And uh, it goes back to the definition, what I think is mm-hmm. the definition of an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur is a person that defies the status quo. Uh, you have a problem. You need to find a solution. Go around it, but okay. you need to actually do it. Did you did you break some some rules? To for instance, some scare some scary rules. Not scary rules. Then. No, I mean nothing illegal. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean um, uh, taking risks. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because defining the status quo. Yeah, yeah. Means uh, no, but but it's it's finding solutions to problems. But of course, you know, like you need to remain like in the legal framework. I mean, like you never, you know, like go beyond that. Uh, but then, you know, like what what are the loopholes? You know, like from a legal perspective, uh, how can I do things indirectly and still, you know, like uh, have them work? Um, yeah, so th- these kind of things, you know, like you always need to think outside the box. Okay, thank yeah. you very much, Nordin, for sharing all this wisdom. Yeah. And taking the time, I want to finish with your uh, resources, please. Mm-hmm. Um, if you have some resources, books or whatever on uh, on uh-huh. mindset, uh, co- startup culture, yeah, please. Um, I personally um, liked uh, two books. One was uh, by uh, one of the uh, most iconic. Uh, uh, Silicon Valley executive who was Andy Grove. Andy Grove was the third CEO of Intel and is considered till today like one of the, um, um, you know, like uh, most impactful uh, uh, executive in Silicon Valley. Like, you know, like his methods, his, you know, charisma, like the risk taking that, uh, that he had uh, in the region. And so he wrote like this amazing book called like Only the Paranoid Survive. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's still, you know, like in uh, like yeah, a reference book, uh, honestly, like in uh, uh, in entrepreneurship and management, uh, okay. like in Silicon Valley and other parts of the world. So an entrepreneur is a paranoid. Oh, uh, you have to, yeah, only defying the status quo. Oh. If I may add to the yeah, 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 to like your you definition. Have, yeah, you have to be paranoid, honestly. Okay. Um, uh, and then there is a second book which really like goes into the details of like the life of an entrepreneur mm-hmm. like the hard decisions that need to be made uh and actually the book is called like the hard things about hard things okay. um and it was written by ben horowitz ben horowitz is, was like a very early employee of netscape if you guys like remember like the first internet yeah. browser and then went on to actually create a uh, or found like the first cloud company with his partner who was uh Uh, 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 Andreessen and uh, Mark Andreessen and uh, and that company so Netscape was acquired by AOL and then uh, 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 LoudCloud was acquired by HP and then these two decided to actually create like a VC firm like you know like uh, an investment firm which is now like one of the biggest in, uh, in Silicon Valley And uh, what he does in his book, because, you know, like we, we always romanticize mm-hmm. like the life of an entrepreneur, but you cannot imagine the hardship, the, the hard decisions to make. And that book kind of goes into those details, okay. like, like real cases uh, and make them, you know, uh, 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 you know, kind of like give concrete uh, solutions to those problems. So, okay. so those were, are really like the two that I strongly recommend. So. Thank you very much, Nordin. We didn't have much time to go through other, um, other um, maybe ideas, but I'm. Thank you very much for your time. No, it was really I a hope, pleasure. I hope one day I will be able to read your book about your story. <laughs> uh, sincerely, because because I am very uh, sensitive to your your storytelling, uh-huh. your story, uh-huh. and uh, your ambition. And uh, I hope that you will write down. Uh, well, I, I don't know if it's worth it to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you didn't have that idea in mind, but uh-huh, uh, let me yeah. uh, let me push it forward a okay. little bit so this morning. Good. Thank you very much, Nordin. All the best for uh, Yasir you for and the teams the and the teams at the international level. Uh, of course, uh, let's hope for a series C, right? That's the uh, that's uh, how uh, yeah. how thing goes yeah, yeah. in in uh, in uh, in yeah. your world. And yeah, as I mentioned earlier, like you know, fundraising becomes the, uh, a full time job. So okay. yeah, like you know, we close series B. We're already working on series C. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Have a good day. You too. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye.
Merci d'avoir suivi cet épisode de Génération Kairos. Avant de nous quitter, si vous l'avez aimé, vous pouvez vraiment m'aider à le faire connaître avec trois actions simples à faire en urgence. D'abord, le liker, le partager et laisser un message sur les pages Facebook et LinkedIn. Ensuite, abonnez-vous sur votre plateforme préférée de podcast, que ce soit Apple, Google, Spotify ou Deezer. Si vous êtes sur Apple Podcast, allez-y et notez le podcast si possible. 5 petites étoiles et laissez un gentil commentaire. Continuez à en parler aussi autour de vous, cela m'aidera énormément. L'habillage musical du podcast est Tixon et s'appelle New Day. Restez à l'écoute des opportunités, restez à l'écoute de Génération Kairos. Ciao